So after learning about the shear force diagrams and the bending moment diagrams and how the shear forces and the bending moments vary along the length of the beam depending upon the loading and the beam support conditions now we are going to focus on the theory of simple bending and in another words it is also known as the pure bending now you might be you know uh, slightly misled by what do we mean by pure bending or what do we mean by simple bending well i mean it 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 of course means that that you are you are you are you know removing the effect of shear in while you are calculating the section displacements and the section deformation so you are purely focusing on the effects of bending and the and the pure bending and the theory of simple bending essentially says another name for pure bending essentially says that we are looking at places or sections within the beam where the bending moment stays constant now uh, in real life scenarios as you saw while you drew the shear force diagrams and the bending moment diagrams there are you know the bending moment is a it varies along the length of the beam depending upon the loads and the support so the formulations and everything which we are going to derive by looking at sections of the beam where the shear is zero and correspondingly the bending moment is a constant this can also be applied to the non uniform bending unless you have a sudden jump in the moment so if you have places where you have a you know kind of a transition of the moment if you take smaller chunks in of the regions of the transition there roughly the bending moment is more or less constant or some of these concepts which we are going to discuss will still hold over there now one classic example of the pure bending or the simple bending as you see over here is the weight lifter and we will see in a couple of pages that why uh, this is a case where there are regions within the beam in this case the rod uh, the shear force will be zero and you will have you will have a constant bending moment right so let's go ahead and start with this particular topic so first of all uh, let's see some of the examples where we you know take a look at the pure bending that is there is no effect of shear so one of the examples is this one where you have a simply supported load with you know two moments m1 and m1 if you draw the shear force diagram for this is a you know, it will have a zero shear force and consequently you will have a constant bending moment now why we have a constant bending moment now remember that the formula which we had derived while we were looking at the relationship that my uh, dm dx was equals to v right so for moment to be constant for it to be a case of the simple bending which means a moment is a constant or a pure bending where a shear is zero so if you put a v equals to zero over here that means your moment is a constant bending moment right so this is one of the cases and here you can say that since this beam if you just take a look at the moment how do we expect this beam to bend this beam would most likely bend something like this over here right so it is a positive convention remember the sagging effect which we term as positive over here and as you see the bending moment the entire bending moment is in the upper half plane it's a positive m uh, in in contrast to that if you look at the second beam where you have a cantilever and you're applying this moment m2 over here so if you have a cantilever and you're applying you know this is a kind of a moment m2 so what you're seeing is a sagging kind is a is a hogging kind of a moment sorry so this beam you know bends something like this yeah, so it is a negative bending so that you can see here as well so the entire bending moment diagram is in the lower half plane with a value of minus m2 over here in in both these cases the first two cases the shear force is zero along the entire length of the beam but if you take a look at the third case over here here you have uh, a beam where two intermediate loads p so as a result of which you have two reactions p and p over here now if you draw the shear force diagram for this beam uh, if you follow closely the relationship so here you have you start with a vertical p over here you go for as a constant line and here you are meeting a uh, concentrated load so there is a going to be a jump in the shear so what was p it comes down back to zero and then since there is no load in between you get a constant of zero shear force and in this region you can say that you will have a constant bending moment of pa over here right so now th this case this case is also very similar to what we looked at the weightlifter so if you see the weightlifter's hands over here at the two ends you have the two point two loads which are going down and intermediate you have the support so it's essentially it is the similar beam like this just you know flipped so for the weightlifters case you will have uh, i should have drawn this slightly below let me just draw it below so the weightlifters case it will be 
something like this so where you have the weights which are going down the two end loads which are there and intermediate you have the weight lifters hand so if you draw the shear force diagram for this one it will be something similar to this one but it will be just flipped so this rectangle will be down and this rectangle will be up over here and in this case also this particular region that you're looking at this particular region will also be a constant bending moment so you will have a pure bending case there as well right so now that we know that what a pure bending is so essentially it is sections where the bending moment is a constant so in those regions where the bending moment is a constant how does the beam deflect or how does the beam behave let us take a look at it so if you consider sections in pure bending right so uh, sections in pure bending it bends the beam into the arcs of a circle so if you have a beam regardless of the cross section remember we, we are uh, always in the back of our mind we have this that the cross section of the beam has to always be a rectangular cross section that is not the case your beam can have you know different as long as it's prismatic all these derivations that we are going to do all these assumptions are valid so in, instead of being a rectangular cross section if it's a circular beam or a beam which a trapezoidal shape like this one over here if you have the if you have the uh, the, the pure bending where you have the constant bending moments it is still going to bend in the arc of a circle that you see over here so what it essentially means is that you will have a radius of curvature so let's say the radius of curvature is rho over here right and this row along that particular arc stays constant so if this is my point d intermediate over here and i say i mark two more points say b and c over here at b the radius of curvature is rho at d the radius of curvature is rho at c the radius of curvature so essentially it bends into the arc of a circle that is there so now that we understand that that how the phenomena of pure bending acts how does it deflect the beam and points along the beam where it bends right it bends into the arc of a circle and in those regions we'll have the constant radius of curvature over here now now remember if you have to draw parallels between you know what is a positive curvature and what is a negative curvature it follows closely with your concept of the bending moment now remember for the bending moment what we had studied is that if our beam bends like this right which is that the smiley face remember if your beam bends like this over here this is a, a sagging bending moment so this is a positive m and a positive rho as well right on the other hand if your if your beam is bending like this right then that is a negative m and a negative rho so that is your hogging kind of a moment that you have so this is sagging and this is hogging that you have over here so let's go ahead and take these concepts a little bit further so if you uh, consider a beam for example this cantilever that you see over here where at the end you are pulling vertically up with a force p so the deflected shape of the beam is something like this and from this you can you can tell that it is a sagging kind of a movement so if you are doing like this it is a sagging kind of a movement so it's a positive curvature that you're looking at so so this is what we were we were showing so it is a positive curvature and moment also so let's make a note of that as well and this is a negative curvature and a negative moment that you have right so here if we now have to you know sort of write the formulations for the for the between the curvature and the angle over here right so since we are saying that this bends in the arc of a circle so we have this row over here and say this beam you know was originally around the x-axis and for small deflections let's let's just try to write some of the relationships that might exist so this length ds which is that arc a small arc of the circle we can express that as my rho times d theta will be equals to ds right where i know my rho which i marked rho is nothing but my radius of curvature now what is the relationship between the radius of curvature and curvature we have kappa remember this is another another greek symbol which which you are probably familiar with to represent um, a curvature so we have this kappa which is equals to one over rho and kappa is nothing but the curvature so the curvature is reciprocal of the radius of curvature that we have over here so if we have to express so what we can get from this uh, these two relationships is that your 
kappa is equals to 1 over rho which will be equal to your d theta by ds right so now for small deflections if this amount deflection is small and when we are talking about beams and so on we are talking about small deflections only this ds can be approximated to the original length dx so typically this is written as so for small for small deflections we can write that kappa is equals to 1 over rho equals to d theta by d so this is an important relationship you will see that we will make a use of this one to derive some of the formulations and everything later so this is the you know curvature or the radius of curvature how it varies and, and you know for if, if it's if it inscribes an angle of theta how it is related to the the curvature that kappa equals to d theta over dx now moving ahead let's let's now you know leave all this math and everything behind and just try to understand that how a beam deflects and uh, intuitively what are some of the you know the rules what are some of the assumptions we can underlay when we are talking about the pure bending or bending in general right now what i want you to focus is is these figures over here so let's just start with this one so here you have a part of a beam remember the section lines that we had discussed which is a part of a bigger beam you are taking a small chunk of that so and as i said it need not be rectangular it can be any prismatic section that you have so for this beam say after a long long distance it, you'd have you know the point uh, o over here where you have you know this distance this is the your uh, radius of curvature that you have over here rho which inscribes this d theta angle over here so this is uh, meets at a farther distance away and that's why you have the section break line over here as well right and let's see that how how and and you know what kind of effects happen so that is more important to intuitively understand so first of all if you take this beam over here when it bends so let's just see so you see these lines these sections over here for example if you uh, take a look at these sections these vertical sections that are over here these vertical lines that we have drawn the black lines over here when the beam is straight they are straight and when the beam bends do these sections warp no they don't warp they continue to remain plain so if you if you take any one of these black lines right if this was the original you know plain section that was there after bending you know that remains plain so there is no warping if you take any of these black lines that you see over here what was plain after bending it remains plain so what does what does that mean that means your plain sections remain plain before and after the bending so if you essentially take a cross section so that was you know something like this and it has only shifted so plane sections remain plane before and after bending okay what is another thing which we can see again if you see over here if you consider this top black line between the end vertical lines this one and this one over here if you see this top black line and the bottom black line over here initially in the undeformed configuration both these lines the top one and the bottom one are made of the same length now when i am bending this one over here can you see the change that is happening the top line actually contracts and the bottom line expands so what does that mean and what kind of a moment is this is the sagging kind of a positive moment right so when i am doing this there is a reduction in the length of the top line but an expansion in the length of the bottom line over here so the top line contracts and the bottom line expands of course if you're bending it the other way you will have a different phenomena completely opposite phenomena where your top line is going an increase in length and the bottom line over here this one is going to is undergoing a decrease in length over here so now if one of the lines is having a decrease in length the top one and the bottom one is having an increase in length in between in between the top and the bottom there must be one line which does not change any length at all because the top one is decreasing bottom one is increasing so in between you must have a line where nothing changes okay so what are the three things we looked at first is that plane sections let me just go back to the uh, page over here so plane sections before and after bending remain plane so there is no warping there is no sections being twisted out of their place so the plane sections remain plane the 
top line over here if you are looking at the positive bending moment k is the top line contracts and the bottom one expands so the top point contracts means what the top part is undergoing a compression so you see it is undergoing a shortening in length so that means the top line is undergoing compression whereas the bottom part over here the bottom part, top part of the beam is undergoing tension because it is going an expansion in length right and consequently in between the top and the bottom you must have a line which is known as the neutral axis we will see in that particular line does not undergo any change in length so that brings you to three of the primary assumptions of a pure bending which are these ones over here that is it states that plane sections remain plane before and after bending that's the first one that we saw right the second one is that the bottom of the beam is in tension that it, it elongates because initially both lengths were the same now the bottom one has elongated the top one has contracted so the bottom part of the beam is in tension and the top part of the beam is in compression but remember this is for a positive curvature only this is for the positive moment and curvature if you are of course you know making a hogging moment or a negative curvature or a negative moment then this statement will just flip that the top part of the beam uh, will be in uh, tension and the bottom part will be in compression right and the last one the last assumption that you have over here that in between in between the top and the bottom there must be a line so if any of these any of these horizontal lines over here which you see across the length of the beam there must be one such line along which there is no change of length because the top is shortening bottom is expanding so in between you must have a line which does not undergo any change of length or in other words it has no tension neither compression right so these are the three fundamental assumptions that you see or mostly facts because for the pure bending these are facts the so plane sections remain plane before and after bending bottom part of the beam is in tension top part of the beam is in compression if you're looking at the positive curvature and then in between you must have a plane which is very very importantly known as the neutral axis or you will see often in book this is known as na where there is no uh, change in length or essentially no tension or no compression what we are going to do next is that we are going to take these assumptions and go ahead and we are going to look at uh, the cases where uh, we are going to derive the flexure formula where we make use of some of these assumptions and also the curvature formula that we looked at